Well, good morning. Thanks for joining us this weekend for worship here at St. John's. Uh, we are in the middle of a series called While We Wait, and I don't think any of us really enjoys the waiting process because waiting leaves you with a level of angst. There's still a level of unresolved tension that is there, and, uh, and sometimes it leads us to a place where we second guess what we thought was true, what we are banking our hopes on. So we're going to be really focused on that word hope today within worship. Where, are, where is our hope as believers, and how can we have that confidence, even when we find ourselves in those hopeless situations, in those places where we are grieving the loss of loved ones? So let's stand, let's welcome each other to worship this morning, and then you can take a seat as we sing our opening hymn, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending.
we stand as we gather to worship, acknowledging as we do in the Lord's Prayer, for thine is the kingdom, thine is the power, thine is the glory, now and forever. Let's gather in his name, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Psalm 70 gathers us with these words. Hasten, O God, to save me. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say, The Lord is great. You are my help and my deliverer. Lord, do not delay. As we find ourselves waiting for the Lord to return, we realize we still live in a sinful world. We realize those words of Scripture. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let us then responsibly confess our sins to God our Father. Merciful Lord, as we await the day to come when Christ returns, we grow impatient as we wait. We become distracted by the things of this world that do not last. 
Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you then to stand this morning out of respect for the reading of our Holy Gospel as we find ourselves in this season and this series while we wait. We've noticed that the Gospel readings focus on a number of parables that Jesus tells to his disciples while they wait. So Matthew 25, 1 through 13. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. This is the gospel of the Lord. We join together then in confessing our faith today using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God and Son of God, the God of his Father before all. God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate.
that confidence as we wait. In your name we pray. Amen. Have you ever found yourself second-guessing? Like sometimes we second-guess ourselves. Like when it comes to a a parenting decision that we make, I I thought that I was doing what was good and best for my kids, but, but what if it wasn't? What if I mess my kids up? Or sometimes we, we second guess a relationship that we're in. Like, I, I don't know, am I, am I supposed to be with this person? I, I think we're meant to be together, but, but I don't know right now. Or sometimes we, we second guess the way that we respond in an email or some sort of text correspondence with someone. I, I think I'm being clear, but, but I don't know. Maybe my words are being misconstrued, misinterpreted. And sometimes it's not that we're second guessing ourselves. Sometimes it's that we're, we're second-guessing other people around us. Like we're second-guessing their motives, their intentions. I, I thought that they were genuine, but, but maybe there's some ulterior motive that they have here at this moment. Or we second-guess their knowledge of a particular situation. Like do they really know what they're talking about or are they just blowing smoke right now? Or we second-guess a decision that they're making, maybe a financial decision. I, I don't know. Like, I, I'm not sure that I'd be spending my money like that right now. This is what we do. We second-guess ourselves, and we second-guess other people around us. And what I've seen is that we tend to do this more and more as we find ourselves in this place where we're waiting. See, waiting tends to cause second-guessing. The more that time goes by with, with unresolved tension, like you're, you're not completely confident about the future, you're just spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning, and it just causes all of these questions that are unanswered for you. This is where we are this weekend as we continue our series while we wait. We're taking a look at the book of 1 Thessalonians, and as Paul writes this letter, the people in Thessalonica find themselves waiting. And as they wait for the return of Jesus, as they pin all of their hopes on this, it's hard for them because they believe that his return is imminent. And yet they watch as one loved one after another is buried and their bodies are put in the ground. And it causes all kinds of questions like, Okay, we, we know that Jesus is coming again, but, but what about for those that have died? Are they somehow going to miss out on the second coming? And so Paul writes these words in, other, in order to, to clear things up for them, in order to give them certainty so that they don't have to second guess the second coming, and neither do you and I. So he sets the context with these words in verse 13 of chapter 4. Brothers and sisters, We do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Paul keys in on a common experience for all of humanity. Grief. This is what happens when you love someone and you lose them. There's grief, there's heartbreak. And it is gut-wrenching. And some of you, you are in that place right now. Some of you, the grief is fresh. It's just been a few months since you've lost someone close to you. Some of you, it's been years, and yet the grief is still there, and there are moments where it is right there in front of you, and it hurts, and it's hard. And Paul acknowledges that. We grieve. But, as Christians, we don't grieve like the rest of mankind, like the rest of pagan unbelievers who have no hope. See, this is what they believed in first century Thessalonica. You live, you die, and that's it. Death is this black hole of hopelessness. So there's a, an archaeological inscription that was discovered in Thessalonica, and it read this, After death, no reviving. After the grave, no meeting again. How depressing. 
And I wonder if maybe Paul had this in mind, this mindset, this inscription as he writes to them and he says, we grieve, our hearts break when we lose loved ones, but we don't grieve like others who have no hope. And then he points them to the hope that we have in Jesus. Verse 14, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Everything hinges upon Jesus for Paul. Our hope hinges on Jesus. On his death and his resurrection. Those are are the hinge points of human history. That's the hinge of the biblical story. It's like the two pins in a door. You take those out and everything falls apart. But you leave those hinges in and it opens you up to a hope-filled future. And what does this mean? Paul says we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep. And I love that imagery of falling asleep in Jesus. Paul actually lifts this from the Gospels, from the way that Jesus speaks about death. As he encounters people who have died, he'll say things like, you know, that girl, she's not dead, she's just sleeping. Now, is she dead? Has her heart stopped beating? Has her brain wave activity ceased? Yeah, she's dead. And yet Jesus can stare in the face of death and say, death? is not the end. She's only sleeping. Because what does it mean when somebody sleeps? It means they're going to wake up again. And so this means for us as Christians, we don't have to dread the bed. We don't have to fear falling asleep and never waking up again. Which was a fear for me when I was a kid. Especially when my parents taught me the prayer, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I didn't, I didn't like this prayer. Because you know what it says? If I should die before I wake, that scarred me. As a little kid, I found myself struggling at times for hours on end to fall asleep because I was afraid. What if something happens before I wake up? And Paul says, we don't have to dread the bed because in Jesus all who fall asleep in him will wake up will rise again and then he goes on to lay out three key aspects of the second coming so that we don't have to second guess that number one Jesus will return number two believers will rise and number three all will be reunited so first Jesus will return It says in verse 16, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God. Actually, Jesus uses similar imagery and language in Matthew chapter 24 as he talked about the Son of Man coming on the clouds. And what a sight, what a glorious sight to look up and to know that one day, the same way in which Jesus ascended into heaven is the way that he will descend and he will return to us and every eye will see him and he will be accompanied by the angels and a trumpet sound that, that pierces the atmosphere. We can't even fathom what that's going to be like. But that's what we're looking forward to. Jesus will return. And when he t- returns... What happens? Believers will rise. All who have put their hope in Jesus will rise. He says, the dead in Christ will rise first. This is where Paul addresses the concerns of the Thessalonian church. Like, okay, what's happened to our loved ones who we've laid to rest in the grave? And Paul says, they're going to be the first ones to experience the resurrection. They're going to be the first ones to experience the risen Christ. And so it's not only that we're looking up and beholding the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds, but we're also realizing that these graves are busting open and bodies are breaking out. They're alive to be with the Lord, which leads us to the third reality 
that all will be reunited. So he says in verse 17, After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. How many of you have ever been to a high school reunion? Some of you, maybe it's, it's 15, 20, 30. Some of you are like, I'm not even going to tell you how many years it's been. But I've been to a lot of high school reunions. Some of you, you, you've been to a regular summer family reunion. And you think about the concept of a reunion. You're getting together with people that maybe you haven't seen in some time, but you share a common bond with them. This is what we're looking forward to. For some of you, there are loved ones that you have lost, and it's been years, maybe even decades, since you've seen them. But because of that common bond, because of the faith that you have in Jesus, that day will come, and I know some of you aren't looking forward to this, where you have that great reunion, where you, once again you can catch up. And, and the words at the end of verse 17, they, they, they get me every time. They bring tears to my eyes. They fill my heart with longing and joy. He writes, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Like that's what our hearts long for. Just slow down for a moment. Soak in those words. We, that's you, that's me, that's all believers we will be with the Lord. Our Savior, Jesus, the one who suffered and died and rose again, the one who is reigning, the one who is returning, we will be with the Lord. How long? Forever. Today. Tomorrow. For all eternity. No more suffering, no more sorrow, no more shame, no more second guessing either ourselves or others around us. And this is what our hearts long for. This is what we look forward to in the midst of the losses that we experience in our lives. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And then Paul concludes with these words in verse 18. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. I think one of the places where we tend to second-guess ourselves is when it comes to what to say to someone who has lost a loved one. Like, how many times haven't you stood in the line at a visitation and found yourself a little bit anxious, wondering, what am I supposed to say right now? Because I'm sorry for your loss doesn't seem like enough. Paul says, encourage one another. How? With these words. He's already given us the words that we're supposed to say. It's right here, words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And so you don't have to quote them. Let me just summarize it for you. Here's what you can say. In Jesus, we'll all be together again soon. It doesn't negate the heartbreak the loss. It's still there, and I am sorry for your loss. But I want you to know the hope that we have, that in Jesus, we will all be together again soon. So as we wrap things up as a pastor, I, I just want to give one final plug. Jesus says that we are to encourage one another. And I believe that there are some of you here this morning, you need that encouragement. Because you're grieving. You've lost loved ones recently, and it's raw, and it's real, and it's a grueling journey that you're walking. And it's unknown, and it changes day to day. But what I want you to know is that there are people here at St. John's who want to support you through the grieving process. In fact, every Monday we have a support group, a grief support group that meets from 4.30 to 6.30. And what I see as I spend time with the grief support group is I see 
people who want to encourage others in the midst of their grief and loss, who want them to experience love, who want to extend hope to them, the same hope that they have, that they cling to in their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if you are grieving the loss of someone and nobody's ever invited you to our grief support group, let me be the first one to say, come. It's a decision that you don't have to second guess. Just like you don't have to second guess the second coming of Jesus. He's coming for you, for me, for all believers. Encourage one another with those words. Amen. We're going to receive our offering at this time and... And as we do, we have a special opportunity to have our first through fourth grade students from St. John's School share with us. So I'm going to invite them to come forward at this time, Mr. Z to come forward, and then our ushers to come forward as we receive our offering.
Lord Jesus, help us to keep moving forward. Help us to keep looking forward. Help us to see that you are enough, that your love is enough for us. The hope that we have is enough for us. And yet, Lord, we acknowledge also this morning the, the grief, the heartbreak, the losses in our lives. And I pray for those who find themselves where, where that's real and raw this morning. That just like you shared hope-filled words with the Thessalonian church, that you would share them with us. That we believe that Christ died and rose again, and so he will take with him all those who have fallen asleep in him. Lord, help us to have that as our hope. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we thank you this weekend for those who have served in our military, especially those here in our local community, those here in our congregation who have served our country just as they have served you. Lord, we pray for those who continue to serve, that you would help them to put their trust in you as they work for peace. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we thank you for the gift of life, especially this weekend for the gift of new life to Parker Rice. We pray for him and his family, especially as he's been born premature. We thank you for the level of health that he already has. And we pray for those moments now where he's separated from his parents as he's in the NICU and they're back home. Lord, help him to get the care that he needs so that they can all be together as a family. Lord, in your mercy, and we pray, Father, for those who find themselves sick and hospitalized, who need that extra measure of hope that is found in you, for Gino Patrini, Jude Johnson, Roland Lotzig, Todd Schultz, Shelley Joseph, Mona Pieper, Steve Van Lith, Gail Tim, Gary Lick, Randy Feltman, Gene Thomas, Andy Hankey, Bruce, Barb Mathwig, Mel Beyer, Lauren Padal, Carmen Mazenbring, Don Burge, Yvonne Nelson, Kim Switch, Mickey Buckentine, Kurt Braun, John Prochnow, Steve Evans, Lori Storms, Chad Hankey, Jerry Radke, and Cindy Beck. Lord, in your mercy, these prayers, Father, and others, you know, and we lift them up to you. In the name of Jesus, who's taught and invited us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So today we remember our Lord Jesus Christ on the night when he was betrayed, that he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also after supper, we remember that he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink of it, in remembrance of me. This is a meal that does two things. It, it, it looks back, it looks back to Jesus' suffering and death on the cross for us, but it also looks forward, and so there's, there's a longing in our hearts, and even Jesus, as he celebrates this meal with his disciples, says, I won't eat this with you again until you share it with me in my kingdom. And so, as we gather for this meal, we, we recognize that we're still waiting, we're still longing for Jesus to return. And, and we're longing to be reunited with other believers. This is communion. This is all coming together. You talk about a great family reunion. This is anticipating. It's a foretaste of the feast which is to come. And I know that there's some people in your life right now who are not here because they're with Jesus. But Jesus is here with us. And so uh, part of the communion liturgy which we use at times says, therefore with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name. 
So we're gathering to celebrate this meal with Jesus, knowing that there are loved ones who are already sharing in this meal, celebrating with him in eternity. And so I want you to come today. I want you to come with hearts that are longing. And, and maybe some of you are, are carrying in your heart someone that you have loved and lost who is a believer in Jesus. And you're looking forward to that opportunity to see them again. Bring that with you today. Receive Jesus. Find your hope in him. So the ushers are going to invite you to come forward from the center aisles. You'll receive the bread from us as a pastoral team. The wine will be placed on the tables in front of you. And then there are baskets where you can discard your empty cups. You may be seated as we sing our Agnus Day and prepare for communion. Declared the grave has 
And now may this true body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you, keep you steadfast, hope-filled in the one true faith, and to life everlasting, go in peace. Amen. Paul ends his letter to the Thessalonians with these words, a word of blessing for them and for us. May the God of peace sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen. We close by singing, The Church's One Foundation. <laughs>